we will start uh, where we left off from the last time, chapter 2, verse 69. We are now coming towards the end of chapter 2 and uh, coming to the more practical part eventually. But verse 69 is a very, very beautiful verse and uh, very deep, very meaningful. I hope you enjoy it as, as much as I do. Verse 69 says, That which is night to the ordinary human being is day to the wise, and that in which the ordinary human being remains awake is night to the wise one who sees. A very mysterious verse, very deep, very meaningful. It has layers of wisdom. First, in the most um, obvious um, message here is that most people are active during the day and they spend the nights sleeping. But there are certain type of people who are awake at night. So there are three kinds of people that are awake at night. We say the three kind of people are the rogis, the bogies and the yogis. A rogi is somebody who is very sick, diseased person. Somebody who is diseased, you know, is not able to sleep at night. He keeps up at night. It's not a very nice, uh, pleasant uh, staying up. It uh, means that the person is um, suffering physically, cannot breathe, is restless, uh, is worried, stressed, and all various reasons which are causing him to keep awake at night leading to further sickness and disease. So such a person is a rogi. The others are the bhogis. A bhogi is the one who is very materialistic, decadent. We know the people who are enjoying the life of decadence, materialism, they like to keep up at night. They drink, they eat, they indulge in sensual, sexual pleasures and the favorable time for them to engage in these activities is at night. So we prefer to engage in such activities at night so that the world does not see what we are doing. So these are secret activities. They are some of them are taboo, so when we indulge in these activities which are the darker aspect of our mind is playing out there, that's why we use the night for these kind of activities. So these are the pogis and the third kind is the yogi. Why does the yogi keep up at night? Some of us know, for example, have been told very often that the best time to meditate is in the early hours of the morning. You know, so people say Brahma Murat, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. This is the ideal time to do sadhana. So why does it here speak of the night? Vedic practices are done during the daytime, but the tantric practices are done at night. And why is that so? When we talk about sadhana, there are those who are practicing some asanas, some pranayam, and a little bit of simple meditation. What do I mean by simple meditation? When you do not attain a very deep 
um, the deeper layers of your mind. You do not attain the higher levels of consciousness. You are skimming on the surface. That is what I mean by simple meditation. But when you go into deeper meditation and you want to begin to work with the unconscious mind, you're, you're going into far, far deeper layers of the mind, then you will find you become extremely sensitive. Such a yogi, such a meditator finds the daytime very disturbing because there are a lot of activities happening in the world. Nature is awake. When nature wakes up, there's a different atmosphere. There's a lot of movement. And when nature sleeps, everybody sleeps. Vibrations calm down. For a yogi of that order who wants to explore the unconscious mind, he prefers to do this at night because the world has calmed down. All of nature calms down. The animals sleep, the plants sleep, nature quietens down. That is the way of nature. As well as the unconscious mind, which is in the night far more active. When you go to sleep, the conscious mind sleeps. It's the unconscious mind becomes active. So if you want to explore the unconscious mind, the night is a very good time for meditation. So the Vedic practices generally comprise of three practices which are at dawn, at midday and at dusk. The fourth practice, the tantric practice, is the one which is done at night. So this is one aspect one layer of this verse. The other is also very beautiful that the way we see the world, the average person, the ordinary person, sees the world in a particular way. So, we encourage attachments we have institutions like marriage and family. We encourage these kind of bondings. And we have certain duties that we perform. So all this is a part of the world, which is happening during the day. Right? It's the waking state. But... The yogi sees this in a very different way. He sees these attachments not as very useful. So what seems to you, or an ordinary person, as good, worthy of encouraging, promoting, would be to a yogi something not worthy of promoting. Take, for example, the attachment that parents may have to their children. They get excessively attached. And when they get excessively attached to the children, they do not allow the children the space to grow, to transform, to develop. So a person who is very attached would say to his child, Oh, I'm, I'm very fond of my child. I love my child. So what you call love, what you call fondness is actually attachment. A yogi or a person who is less attached, it's not as if he doesn't love or he doesn't care or he's insensitive or has no emotions. But he sees that it's important to give the child the space to grow in his own way, to flower, to blossom, to develop in his or her own way. So it's a very different perspective. 
the way such a person looks at things. With the ordinary way of looking at the world around us, we keep encouraging more attachment, aversions, egoism. We even encourage fears because we say, oh, if I don't take care of my child, no, I worry about my child. Every parent worries about the child. So you even think that's a part of the package. But you don't have to worry about the child. It doesn't mean that you don't care about the child. But there's a way of looking at this which encourages all these. And these are nothing other than the kleshas, what I mentioned. So the fear, the attachment, the aversions which you have in our day-to-day -day life, the egoism, all these are ignorance. And these were the five kleshas. So this is the way ordinary person in worldly life goes through continuously encouraging these five kleshas. The kleshas, as you know, come from the Yoga Sutras. And the yogi does not. So he sees our life as darkness. So to that person, what is night to you is daylight to him and what is day to you is night to him. You may think, oh my God, he, he's, how can he live like this? He's not attached to anything. He's, he hardly has any possessions. And you think, oh my God, this is terrible. But it is a tremendous freedom, a tremendous sense of joy that such a person experiences cannot be experienced by those who are lost in the glaciers, in the darkness of these glaciers. So that which is day to the ordinary human being is night to the wise. Any questions on that so far? Are we clear? seems to be clear. So I will continue. Now we come to the very last verses of chapter 2. Verses 70 to 72. As waters enter the ocean which is totally full, yet whose basin and boundaries remain stable, he whom all the desires enter similarly attains peace and not one who desires the desires. The person who wanders free of attachment, having abandoned all desire, devoid of ego and the concept of mind, he attains peace. This is the godly state, O son of Pritha. Attaining this, one is no longer confused. Remaining in it, even at the final hour, one finds absorption into Brahman. Verse 70, you may have noticed, doesn't seem to make that much sense. Translation is not very good here. And I would say that this is a verse which is referring to idea of when a river, rivers, there are many, many rivers all around the world which enter the oceans of the world. Yet, even though these oceans are full, even with all the water entering these oceans, it doesn't appear to make any difference. It seems that the oceans are still the same. So, one who is surrounded by objects of desires, you know, worldly objects, but still remains unmoving, unchanged. 
such a person attains peace. Essentially, this is a state of desirelessness. You're surrounded by worldly objects that are desirable, but you do not experience that desire in you. You are a witness, you're observing, and you are unmoving. And such a person is, has attained peace. In verse 71, <clears throat> we speak of the person who wanders free of attachment, having abandoned all desire. So in verse 70, that was clarified. It's a person who is desireless. So a desireless person, one who is devoid of ego and concepts of mind, wanders free of attachment. <clears throat> so now you see that this is the yogi who, who sees everything that we see as what is day for us is night for the yogi. And what is good and bright for us is darkness for him. And what is darkness for us is, is, is good and worthy of aspiration for him. So here is a person who is so free of attachment he wanders free, becomes a wanderer. Padivrajaka. It's one of the states uh, mentioned when one takes sannyas. You know, there are different states. First is um, um, Kutiachar, it's called. They, they move to a little hut which is just outside their own village. So when somebody takes vows of renunciation, he doesn't leave his home and go off into the wide world immediately. He first moves into a little cottage just close to his own village, just outside his own village. And he, outside his own house. And then he accepts food from his house, but but he's not living in the house. Then comes the next stage of Bahuchar. That means he goes outside the village a little bit further away and he accepts food and uh, alms from everybody in the village. So now he's slowly getting detached. And the third stage is of Pradivajaka. He becomes a wanderer. He wanders around everywhere. He may not stay overnight longer than three nights in any village, any town. He has to keep moving so he doesn't get attached. So these are the three. The fourth stage is the stage of attainment. That is a Paramahansa. So what is Paribrajaka? It's not just the three stages of uh, in the life of a sannyasan. It is also that inner the inner phases in you, as you learn to detach yourself, become desireless. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. It takes place. It's an ongoing process. And when you become a wanderer, it means you're one who is established in the self. It's not attached to anything. It's wandering. You see everything around you as... Not mine, not mine. You can enjoy these worldly objects, but you know they do not belong to you. And having attained that, you cannot be confused anymore. One is completely absorbed into that higher state of Brahman. One has attained. You become a witness like when you go and see a film or a, a, a drama. You enjoy the drama. You, you see it's a tragic or it's beautiful. You enjoy those things, but you know that you are not a part of that drama. 
you know you are one of the audience. And so it is when you become a wanderer, Tadivrajaka, you are free of attachment. And that was the very last verse of chapter 2. Uh, Radhika ji, I have a question uh, yeah. Gautam here. Yeah. Yes, Gautam, go ahead. Uh, so can the desire for uh, abiding in self or, or experiencing the self be construed as an attachment? Mm. And if yes, then uh, does it mean that uh, till the time this is not experienced or till the time we don't abide in the self, there is a, the, the everlasting peace is not there within? Naturally, desirelessness means even giving up the desire for uh, the self, even giving up the desire to attain any powers or higher levels of consciousness. That is Param Vairagya, supreme desirelessness. Obviously, we should not give up that desire first. That's the desire you give up last, the desire for attaining the highest. It is the lower desires that we should give up first or let go of. So we say that we even strengthen the desire for abiding in the self. And when that desire becomes so strong, so powerful, like a fire that swallows everything else, everything else burns in it, when that fire, the fire of that longing and the desire to attain the highest becomes so powerful, it will burn all other little desires. It will swallow all the other little desires. So yes, you should not give up that desire to attain first. But finally, right at the end, finally you have to even let go of that. Because otherwise that desire also becomes an obstacle. That's the last stage. Until then, we need to strengthen that longing let that fire for the highest, that desire for the highest one so strong that it swallows all other desires. That was a good question. Anybody else? Thank you. Okay, we can go to the next verse, uh, sorry, the next chapter. And the next chapter, chapter 3, is chapter on Karma Yoga. Chapter 2, Sankhya Yoga, was more the theoretical aspect, but it's now getting far more practical and useful for everybody. So we're not just talking about things like desirelessness and consciousness. But now we come down to some very basic, simple ideas. And begins with first two verses with Arjun once again posing some questions that might have been asked by one of us. And he asks, O oh Arjun, uh, oh sorry, O oh Krishna, if you believe wisdom to be greater than action, then why are you urging me toward this terrible action with statements that seem mixed up? You are apparently confusing my intellect. Therefore, tell me one definitive thing whereby I may attain beatitude. So Arjun is here a seeker, just like everybody else here, seems to pose exactly those questions which are in the mind of all seekers. And so he says, 
in chapter 2, you talked so highly of wisdom. You said it was even greater than action. It seemed. Then why are you urging me to take the action of going into this battle? Remember this action that most people interpret as participating in a battle on a battlefield is in reality about looking at our own negative qualities and burning these up in meditation, freeing ourselves from our negative qualities and eventually all qualities to go beyond all dualities. So he says, if you think that wisdom is the finest, then why should I do this? Why are you asking me to do this? And then he says, your, your comments seem to be mixed up, Krishna. You're confusing me. Very typical that students, seekers, meditators who are not completely mature, when they don't understand something, <laughs> they think that the teacher is confusing them. Or that there seem to be conflicts in the teachings or in the scriptures or, or in whatever the, the teacher seems to be saying. Most often, it is not the statements of the teacher that are mixed up, but it is the student who is unable to grasp these teachings and is unable to understand them. So here, Arjun is asking for some rules, something definitive, some guidelines, which again is exactly what even modern students do. We see there is no difference between the students of ancient times if at all the story is based on reality or those of modern times, it's very likely that this really and truly reflects the kind of questions a normal student asks on the path. The doubts that they have are being reflected here. Most of the times it is the interpretation of these scriptures, these teachings that are, are incorrect. When a student is unprepared and listens to these teachings, he misinterprets them. The job of the teacher is to repeatedly correct the student. If the student is really deeply interested, he will listen to the same things again and again and discover maybe the first time that he, he understood whatever he wanted to understand. The second time when he heard it again, he thought he heard it. And the third time he heard it, the same thing repeated by the teacher, he heard it. The fourth time the teacher repeated it, He's beginning to get the message. This keeps on. And the teacher needs to keep repeating these again and again. Very often I myself have been told you keep saying the same things. Is there nothing new to say? And I say to this, no, there is nothing new to say. We are not creating new forms of yoga. The mind is a certain way Society is in a certain way. It manifests in different times, in different ways. 
but the core remains the same. The mind is still made up of manas, buddhi, chitta, and ankara. It may manifest outwardly in different ways. So these teachings can never change. These are eternal teachings. Consciousness is unchanging. We could possibly change techniques, give them different names. But most of the time we see that that's also not necessary. So that repetition is not because the teacher is just a boring person. The repetition is necessary so that the student begins to deal with that information, begins to digest it, integrate it, and live it in his life. Because otherwise, there is a communication gap between the teacher and the student. That's what there is. There's a communication gap. Any questions so far? I just wanted to comment on the aspect you mentioned about the um, eternal truth, so to say, that the consciousness is, consciousness is the same all the time. Yes. And so this is probably also a very strong argument against all these different new yoga styles which are appearing like mushrooms everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, to say that, uh, guys, just look at the core your mind is made up of the same structure. Um, what, I mean, you can give it maybe different names, but it will remain the same. Um, but this, many people don't, don't see that. They, they just create new things, maybe also for selling purposes. They just give it new names, so it sounds different. Mm -hmm. But the core actually remains the same. It's just a new wine, uh, or old wine and new bottles, so to say. Yes. I agree, Joachim, that if the teachings are pure, the practices are pure, the intention is pure, then it is old wine and new bottles. But what is currently happening with all these new forms of brand names, you know, um, forms of yoga, they have nothing to do with yoga. They just have a name, but they actually have nothing to do with yoga. You can practice those things for 10,000 years, but you will still attain nothing because yeah. they are just purely at the physical level. And sometimes they even distort the, the mind. They disturb the pranic vehicles because these practices, some of them are completely misguided. Right. I was actually thinking more in terms of the new Advaita people in this case, specific case. Mm -hmm. I should have clarified this mm -hmm. because I agree the asana yoga, which is uh, practiced so much in the world, is definitely not going around and talking about consciousness. But I was talking more about the new Advaita people who, who, who claim that they're bringing up new stuff, but it's basically the same. How can it be different? Because mm. the mind doesn't change. Yes. It's the same in thousands of years. Yeah, well, most of them are not quite claiming that it's new, but yes, they are putting it in different language. In the text, uh, it was not just about having it written in Sanskrit, but even when they were translated earlier, the language is very academic. Now, people use very different language, make it easier to understand. So in that sense, it is useful that um, this wisdom or this, these teachings are more accessible, just purely in language terms. Um, but once again, this can also be harmful because of the misinterpretation. It happens yeah. very often that people misinterpret this and say, okay, um, 
exactly the very first line what he says here. You believe wisdom to be greater than action, then why are you urging me towards this action? So the very first verse is almost a kind of a statement that a person following Neo Advaita would say. A Neo Advaita would say, I don't need to do anything, I'm already enlightened. And so Arjun is asking, well then why are you asking me to, to practice meditation and look at myself? Because you said, well, we are all enlightened beings, right? We are all consciousness. So why do anything? Yes. So these are exactly the, the kind of misinformation and misunderstanding that is <clears throat> happening all the time. And it requires dedicated guidance over a period of time so that these misunderstandings and misinterpretations are clarified. To be free of them, it's not easy because the mind likes to believe in certain things. A certain person might want to believe that uh, he doesn't need to do any action. He doesn't need to meditate because he is already consciousness. It's very convenient, you know. You don't have to go through this whole process. So, of course, a teacher who says to you, you have to meditate, is not generally going to be very popular. So, that's why the new Advaita teachers are having thousands of students. They're very popular because they are not asking you to do anything. They're not expecting you to do, a, you know, a system, a systematic practice. So that kind of teaching is naturally popular but not necessarily useful. So Krishna answers then in the following verses 3 and 4 yes and he says in verses 3 and 4 O sinless one in this world I have taught two kinds of discipline, the yoga of knowledge for those whose path is of discriminating wisdom and the yoga of action for the yogis. A person does not attain the state of actionlessness simply by not taking initiative in the matter of actions, nor does one attain perfection by mere renunciation. I have to admit here that these two verses are not really well translated. In verse 3, we are referring to two kinds of discipline, the yoga of knowledge and the yoga of action. What basically this is, is is for those who meditate, who want to transform themselves through meditation, and those who have, who don't really meditate. So those who, who meditate go through the process of gaining that knowledge, and the yoga of action is for the yogis who want to go through the process of meditation and attain it through a systematic approach while in the part of contemplation or discriminative wisdom is a more mystical path. Either you are a Bhikkhari and you have attained it or you have to work hard for it. Verse 4 also is a little bit 
clumsy here. There are two kinds of people. What it refers to here is a person does not attain the state of actionless by not taking action. So actionlessness does not mean doing nothing. What is the state of actionlessness? The Sanskrit word used is naishkaryam, non-action. But what is that? That is a state of freedom where your actions do not create any samskaras. There are no impressions. doesn't mean that if you do not do any actions, there will be no impressions. There will still be impressions. Even if you do nothing, you will think, you will feel, and these impressions are stranded in you. So, state of actionlessness is not a good, um, in my view, not a very good um, translation. It should be state of wisdom or state of freedom. If you do not attain the state of freedom or wisdom by refraining from action or abstaining from work, nor will you attain freedom by mere renunciation. So says here, even mere renunciation is not enough. So, what is mere renunciation? Renunciation is tiaga, external renunciation is meant here. And Just giving up objects, worldly objects, does not mean you attain a state of freedom or wisdom. Any questions so far? Questions? Sorry, Sorry Matthew, I'm, I'm not following what you're saying. It's not very clear, Matthias. Well, I made this little line here and now it doesn't erase. I see you renounce the inner attachments. Yes, that's what it means. We need to first be non-attached. That's what we talked about in the earlier verses where we said, become a wanderer. To become a wanderer is not um, done just by renouncing the object itself. To become a wanderer means to be non-attached. Vairagya, not Tyaga alone. Tyaga itself is not enough. Thank you. Okay. So as I said, I'm trying to erase this line, but I'm not able to do that. Yes. Hmm. <clears throat> oh, 
All right, I think I can just stuck with it, I guess. Okay. So come to verse five. No one can remain without performing actions, even for a moment. Every creature is helplessly made to perform action by the gunas born of nature. So verse five tells us that irrespective of what you do, you will perform action. Even if you don't want to, you will be performing some sort of action. So action here does not mean physical action. Action here, karma, action here means the impressions that are created in the mind. This is happening all the time. And they emerge from the gunas, born of nature. The gunas are rajas, tamas and sattva. And this is nature itself. We cannot do anything about it. We are helpless. We are driven by these. And so we cannot be actionless in a physical sense. Therefore, Nishkarma means attaining that state of freedom or wisdom where you witness all your actions. You're not identified with these actions. This is an important verse. If you examine it, contemplate upon it, you will see that if you are helplessly performing actions, how can you really renounce? A lot of people have this idea, I want to renounce. It's a noble intention, but misguided. Because very often, the intention comes from wanting to escape, from escapism. You want to escape performing actions and getting into the cycle of suffering. But you have no choice. If you understand this verse, you realize that Tiaga cannot help us. You need to have vairagya. You need to have it. And if you have to perform action, why not perform that action skillfully? We talked about it in chapter 2. Performing skillfully means to enjoy your, your duties. Not merely thinking of them as a burden, but experiencing joy. Just as you experience joy when you, perf when you have some hobbies. Then you experience a state of joy. You do it without a purpose, without any intention, without any reward, without a desire for praise or recognition. You do it because you enjoy it. And if you perform all your actions in that spirit skillfully, then you are free. So as long as you are helpless and you have to perform action, then learn to enjoy performing your actions and perform them skillfully. Since you really cannot escape from this. That sense of escapism is the problem. Because we do not understand that Tiaga alone does not really help us. We need Vairagya, we need that inner. detachment or non-attachment. The inner renunciation is what is meant. Anybody like to say something about this? Uh, yes. 
Yeah. Uh, the question is actually so there are duties that we are not enjoying at all, <laughs> but we have to do. We, we feel that we have to do them. So what would be the first step, like uh, first aid for this kind <laughs> of duties? <laughs> yeah. Uh... I guess everybody has an experience where there are certain duties that you have to perform which you don't enjoy. Why are you not enjoying them? If you examine it, you're not enjoying them because, one, you expect a reward of some sort, a recognition of some sort, and you're not getting it. That's an aspect of egoism. And the moment that egoism comes, expectation comes, you don't enjoy so if you examine and contemplate upon these actions, study them, observe them, you will see we need to develop that skill. It's a skill. Miklos, you have spent decades studying and have developed some skills, professional skills. Yes? Yes. So over there you were prepared to spend all that time to learn those things step by step so that one day you could, you know, build certain things, for example. Yes. Right? So, yet at the same time, most of us expect that we should be able to start doing our duties without expectation in this manner, as it is described here, just after reading the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> it's obviously not possible. So what I'm trying to say is that it is a skill that one develops over many, many years. It's a long-term process. It's important to contemplate and observe those particular duties that we do not like. Understand why we do not like them. And then find ways to enjoy them just as we would enjoy a hobby. You know, there are certain things that people like to do and they do them without any purpose. Going for a walk, you know, trekking in the mountains, all these things. We enjoy these. We don't seek any purpose. We, we just have a good time. People like to play music, for example. They enjoy the music. But if I would say to that person, now you have to perform in front of an audience, they would get very nervous and they would not enjoy it because they're under pressure. So the moment we take away the pressure, we begin to enjoy it. So I'm sure there are unpleasant duties, for example, in the house. Not everybody likes to do cooking, cleaning, and people turn it into a burden. Yet, there are these things can be enjoyed. If you enjoy them without pressure, just as you enjoy doing things which, which you really do enjoy doing. But it takes time to learn that skill. So, no real quick fix for that. <laughs> <clears throat> just as we spend years studying we also need to, we will probably eventually spend years mastering these uh, techniques, these skills and um, spend a lot of time uh, understanding the teachings in a correct manner and not misinterpreting them to suit our convenience. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you for putting it in the right light. <laughs> So, verse 6 is a very interesting verse. One of deluded psyche who, controlling the senses of action, continues to remember with the mind the objects of the senses is said to be a hypocrite. Once again, I think this is not really the best of translations, but uh, the the essential meaning is, is good, it, it comes across, that if you pretend that you're not interested in these objects, worldly objects, 
but your mind is busy, you know, preoccupied by those worldly objects, then you are a hypocrite. You're a pretender. Mithyachari is the word used in Sanskrit, and Mithyachari is a hypocrite. So if you perform Thyaga, which is external renunciation, but you don't have any internal renunciation, which is Vairagya, then you end up becoming a hypocrite, a Mithyachari. So a great deal of caution to be exercised here by those who are maturing on this path, still not completely mature, begin to think that they need to give up the objects of the world. You know, they need to be ascetics, they need to live simple, life of poverty. And these ideas, in among many young seekers, with genuinely sincere seekers misinterpreting the teachings think that they somehow have to just give up things. Desires are bad, they say, and so this misinterpretation leads us to something terrible, a division in the mind, a complete division in the mind a divided personality, a hypocrite is one who's putting out one face to the world but is a completely different otherwise. This is one of the ways we go furthest away from attaining as, you know, the highest. This is completely the opposite direction. If you want to attain something, be yourself. Accept yourself. And if you have certain desires, you have to find healthy ways of living out those desires. If there are some skaras, they need to be manifested. If they are not manifested, then we have to learn to renounce them internally. Because mere external renunciation is not helping us. So this is a very, very important verse indeed for a lot of people who misunderstand yoga, think that they have to lead a life of poverty, celibacy, you know, that, uh, that enjoyment of any sort is bad. These kind of misunderstandings are rampant, are very prevalent, and actually have created a lot of suffering and misery, rather than helping the young seekers or... Uh, meditators, they, they end up going in completely in the wrong direction, end up suffering and uh, being completely miserable. Any questions on that or comments? I remember, um, I, I don't meet these people so often anymore, but I do remember that uh, earlier I would often meet people who said uh, they were practicing yoga and if you expressed some anger about something, they would say, oh, don't be angry, be peaceful. And I would ask them, but how is it possible to be peaceful if you're angry? What do you do with the anger? And they were not able to explain that. Monotonously repeating, be peaceful, don't be angry, is not helping. So we need to accept our emotions, our maybe desires, fears, negative, positive qualities, all of these. And then work with these rather than pretending that we don't have them. A mithyachari, a pretender or a hypocrite leads a life of duplicity, a double life. 
So you may have heard of cases where people have taken up the path of yoga and then have in secret resorted to, um, you know, indulged in activities that uh, they said they did not indulge in. So um, rather than having the mind dwelling on these kind of thoughts, it's better to accept that the mind is not ready, it's not been prepared for that. So a mithyachari, a hypocrite, a life of duplicity is probably the most uh, uh, difficult things that can happen to a person on this path. So Tyaga, external renunciation, is not for everybody. It is only for those who have prepared themselves. If you have not prepared yourself and you're still dealing with these objects, the senses are preoccupied, the mind is preoccupied, then it is still not the right time. All right. So we could stop here and continue next time. Are there any questions or any comment from anybody? Radhika Ji, this is Shanta. Yeah, Shanta. Um, I would like to ask something. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if the person who, who pretends, mm -hmm. could it be that he's not aware? Could it be that he's not aware of what he really wants? Yes. Indeed, that is true. Sometimes uh, we have people, certain people have such poor self-awareness that they're not even aware that they are pretending. But that's uh, rare. I mean, that's rare, but that happens. That is a, a very um, deep-rooted a uh, split psyche, you know, a psyche that's really split. And uh, that's a pathological state. For such a person, yoga would not be appropriate at all. Right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. This is a... Would it be in the unconscious, would it be in the unconscious mind? And that it has to come forward to the conscious mind? Um... I'm just thinking, you know, yeah, it's yeah. not that I... Yes, um, yeah. if we would go back, uh, I don't have it directly or, um, right now, but you know our our diagram, the circle chart, and we know there's the body, and there's a breath, which is subtler. Yeah. Then there's a conscious yeah. mind, and then there's unconscious mind. Unconscious. Now, the conscious mind is what we present to the world. And the unconscious mind is what we really are, you know, the truth that we have now conceived. So in a sense, we all have a bit of a split personality. Yes, in a sense, we all go to bed at night and we have dreams in the morning. We wake up, but we don't remember our dreams. So we have all kinds of dreams, desires, fears, etc. that are suppressed. So yes, that's happening to everybody. But that's normal that's an ordinary person everybody has it but when it is really deep rooted then the personality is so split that the conscious mind is, is so strong that the person is even through meditation not, you cannot help this person to bring those unconscious parts to surface and into awareness that's a very deep-rooted problem. And so that may take so a this, very long time. Some, yeah, are, these, are, there some, are those the samskaras? All of these are samskaras, yes. All of them? Yes, okay. all are samskaras. But some of the samskaras have been strengthened. So if you have developed, if somebody has developed this kind of a habit to show something to the world but think differently, then you have strengthened that habit. We, we all do it sometimes, you know. 
if if you are practicing yoga and uh, mm-hmm. now you don't want to share that with everybody because maybe everybody doesn't accept it maybe some people don't accept your spiritual way of thinking your lifestyle and so we may be secretive about it we may not share this with everybody and that happens i'm sure that we have experienced it at some point of time or the other so over there there's a sense of uh, awareness yes i don't want to share this with others this is my thing but there's a deeper level of duplicity where you are not even aware like you said that you're doing this you're so split you know that you become something like a compulsive liar you have uh, your mind is preoccupied with certain uh, ideas for example a renunciate whose mind is preoccupied with sexual desires is not able then to manifest and live out these things but the mind is continuously going in that that direction so this becomes a, a double lifestyle pretending to be holy but having such deep desires which is not able to resolve them so you end up in a kind of a dead end there seems to be then no solution what do you do the only thing you can do is give up those vows and then say i'm not a renunciate and then you are free to manifest those things but that means you have to resolve the conflict you have to accept first that you have the these kind of desires that you are unable to let go of that need to be manifested so there are levels and degrees of how deep rooted this can be and certain level which is a normal people we are all doing this partly as i said we all have desires fears emotions that we are not sharing with everybody we keep it to ourselves but when it becomes a pathological problem it's so deep rooted that it begins to affect our life our surroundings in all respects when it starts affecting us then it has become a form of a disease Thank you. Thank you, Radhika ji. Okay, so thank you everybody for being here. And um we continue next time. Hope that that was useful. You enjoyed it and um and maybe you can run an experiment this weekend and be yourself. Be fearless and be yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you, Radhika ji. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.